and just get started. Uh, I know people are still kind of trickling in. Um, but first off, I just want to say hi, everybody, and, and thank you all for coming. I know that um, there's a lot of other things you could be doing tonight. You could be going out to concerts. You could be at bars and restaurants, <laughs> just, like rubbing your face with other people's faces. Um, so it means a lot that you're like here with us tonight. Um, I'm Theo Gordon. I'm chair of San Francisco YIMBY. Um, and um, just wanted to take a second just to, to kind of think about where we are right now. Um, you know, obviously, we're all part of uh, this organization uh, because we want to advance our policies on getting more housing built. Um, but the thing that makes us uh, strong and the thing that makes us, gives us an ability to organize is our community. Um, you've seen this in like interviews that um, have been going on around Gold, the Golden Gates book that just came out, and you've seen other kind of columnists, people who followed us. Um, you know, the national press level say, like, not only is, is YIMBY um, fighting for good policies, but they've, they've turned activism into something that's fun and something that's social. Um, and I think it's a lot of what gets us out there knocking on doors and gets us up at three in the morning on election day is knowing that our friends are going to be there um, and knowing that, like, afterwards we're going to go out and have drinks together. And so um, it's kind of scary to think about what this whole situation is going to mean for our community. Um, and how we're gonna have to uh, work differently. Um, but I think that like, as I've been reflecting on all that, um, something that gives me a lot of hope is that we've always been a very online uh, group of people. Um, and I think we can maintain that same community um, and be there for each other throughout this um, kind of difficult period. Um, and that's gonna make us stronger in the long run. And so we're trying to do a lot of things right now to uh, keep that sense of community um, we're, we're, we're doing a bunch of like online gaming nights. Uh, we're doing Slack chats. Um, we have a bunch of social channels like uh, YA Social Gaming, the books uh, channel, random channel, just for people to communicate with each other and stay in touch and stay social. Um, and we're also looking for more ideas that people have on how we can uh, kind of keep that community going um, throughout this uh, social uh, distancing. Um, and uh, we're also trying to you know, just step up the number of events we're having. So tomorrow night, we're doing a movie night. Uh, so we'll all live watch at the same time, uh, Love Per Square Foot. Uh, and then on Sunday, uh, we're organizing, we've been doing a book club. Uh, so we're gonna organize a book club chat about uh, Golden Gates and the author, Connor Doherty, apparently also has nothing to do on Sunday night. So he is gonna be joining us for this, uh, uh, I think it's an online chat. Um, and then our next big event is the April 1st general meeting. So just like we always do, we have, a we're going to keep our monthly meetings going. Um, and this one should be exciting. We're going to be starting to talk about the November election. And so we have uh, three candidates um, lined up to come in and talk about their supervisor races and just start to introduce themselves to us so that we can decide who we're going to support and, and just understand uh, who's, who's out there, who's running for office. Um, and then there's also a lot of calls to action going on right now, and I'm not going to get be able to remember all of them because uh, I think the uh, there's just stuff going on all around Slack and, and Twitter right now about how we can support the most vulnerable through this um, uh, through this crisis. Uh, so, but the big calls to action right now are uh, we have an action network uh, form to sign a letter uh, supporting uh, homeless funding in the, um, the federal legislation that's coming out right now. Uh, so we need to be pushing our Congress uh, congressional representatives. Uh, to add homeless funding uh, into the coronavirus aid package. Uh, we're also doing some more stuff locally. Um, they have like, uh, Matt Brezina is raising money uh, so that restaurants can provide meals to um, people working in hospitals uh, for free. Uh, that should help both our um, kind of first responders um, get, get food while they're working really hard, uh, but also keep our restaurants in, in business. Um, I've heard that food banks really need a lot more volunteers right now. Uh, so that's another opportunity we can use to get out and, and help people. Um, and uh, there's, there's need for blood donations. Uh, we're also gonna be doing a lot of volunteering uh, uh, events for, for Yimby uh, itself. So we're gonna be doing phone banks and member outreach that Jillian's gonna be leading. Uh, I know I'm just kind of listing off a bunch of things right now, but um, we're gonna post this all in Slack. Uh, also, if you are one of the people who was uh, kind of leading some of those efforts, go ahead and start posting that stuff in Slack now. Um, just as a reminder, it's all together. Um, but overall, we're just going to keep organizing and we're going to keep building our community. We're going to be fighting for the housing that we need because um, we need housing both during crises and, and, and not during crises. Uh, we need to get our, our cities fixed. They need to be well running machines and they need to have the budgets and everything to be able to respond to stuff like this. Um, and we need to support each other so we can get through kind of all this, this challenge together. 
Um, so with all that, um, I'll stop yammering on and uh, hand the mic over to Jordan, who is our uh, one of the events leads for San Francisco Yimby. Uh, and he'll give the agenda and how we're going to run this event. Cool. Thanks, Theo. Um, so my name is Jordan. I'm a volunteer events lead with SF Yimby. Um, and I'm going to go through first some Zoom logistical stuff. Um, and then we can start diving into our presentations. Um, so in order tonight speaking, we're going to have Aaron Eckhouse. Uh, talking about schools and communities first, Laksh Basin talking about the San Francisco Community Housing Act, and Sam Moss talking about affordable homes now. Um, so on Zoom, a couple of things I want to draw everyone's attention to. Number one is the Q&A box down at the bottom. Um, all of the presenters wanted questions to go at the end of their presentation. Um, so if you have a question in the middle of it, open the Q&A box, type in a question, and then at the end of the presentation, uh, the presenter will go through and answer all the questions that are in there. Um, feel free to have conversations in the chat on the sidebar, um, but note that by default, it only goes to the panelists. So that means us. Um, and if you want it to go to the other attendees and have a discussion, feel free to do that. Um, and hopefully some clarifications and stuff can happen that way too. Um, also one more note, this is gonna be recorded um, and distributed afterwards, um, just so that everyone is aware of that. Um, and with that, I think that's everything I have on Zoom Logistics. So I'm going to hand it off to Aaron Eckhouse. Uh, in his words, he's the Bay Area Regional Organizing Director for California Gimby, member of the Schools and Communities First Campaigns Executive Committee, and he's been working to gather signatures to place SCF on the ballot and plan walking tours to educate people about disparities in our tax system and how they affect public services. So go ahead, Aaron. All right. Give me just a second. I'll get my screen sharing set up. All right. Um, so I'm going to talk about schools and communities first, which I think is one of the most exciting things happening in California politics this year, uh, and really a once in a generation opportunity for us to make the tax system in California fairer, more equitable, and also to raise a lot of money that we can spend on all sorts of really good and exciting things. Uh, so what is Schools and Communities First? It is a ballot initiative that has qualified, uh, or we believe has qualified for the November ballot uh, they're in the process of submitting signatures. Obviously, that whole process is a little screwy right now, uh, but they collected over one and a half million signatures over the last several months to place this on the ballot. It would close a corporate property tax loophole that primarily benefits big companies like Chevron, Disney, and Bank of America, uh, and raise $12 billion per year that would go to public schools and local governments across the state of California. This is a permanent long-term revenue source. It's not a one-time infusion of $12 billion. This is gonna be billions and billions of dollars every single year. Uh, it does this with protections for small businesses and it does not affect residential property. So we know that there is a well-funded scare campaign going on about this uh, to try to make people afraid that this is going to raise their property taxes, raise their parents' or grandparents' property taxes. Uh, and that is not the case. It does not affect rental buildings or apartment buildings either. This applies exclusively to commercial and industrial property. A uh, little more detail. Uh, I imagine many of you are familiar with Prop 13 passed in 1978. It did a number of things, but the relevant provision here is that it froze property tax assessments for all property owners uh, to grow no more than uh, inflation or 2% per year um, since 1978. This was pitched as something that was needed to save seniors from being priced out of their home by rising property taxes. But the way it was written, it did not just apply to homeowners and residential property. It also applied to commercial and industrial property. This is really significant because the way property tax reassessment happens under Prop 13 is when property changes hands. Uh, so when people move out of their house, 
or die uh, and if the house is sold, the property tax value reassesses. Corporations are largely immortal. Uh, they are able to hang on to property for much longer than a typical homeowner. And that means we have a lot of the biggest corporations in California who have been continuously owning land since 1978 and are now basically paying property taxes on the 1978 value of that land. Obviously land values in California have gone up a bit in the last 40 years, and, but the property taxes that they pay haven't. This has changed the whole burden of property taxes in California. It used to be that 60% of property tax revenue in California came from corporate property tax versus 40% for residential. That's now flip. 60% of property tax revenue comes from residential sources versus 40% from commercial property taxes. Uh, and it has really gutted the funding base for uh, schools and public services for cities to turn to other uh, sources. Schools and Communities First would reassess commercial and industrial property to the full current value. So the Chevron Refinery or Disneyland, which are currently paying their 1978 values, would pay on the full present value of their land that reflects the fact that California has become a much more desirable place to live and do business and property values have gone up accordingly. Uh, it's getting money from companies that have done really well over the last several decades in California and it's asking them to contribute their fair share to the common needs of uh, the people of California. It includes a protection for small businesses. So businesses with less than $3 million of property are exempt from reassessment under schools and communities first. Uh, and this is, again, this is to protect legacy small businesses so they don't see uh, their property taxes spiked. Why this matters? I think the number one reason it matters is because $12 billion per year is a lot of money and can do a lot of good uh, in California. When Prop 13 passed in 1978, it gutted the funding base for schools in California. California went from having one of the best public school systems in the entire US to we now are, I believe, 41st in per pupil funding nationwide. Uh, we have excessively large class sizes. Many schools lack the resources they need to invest in a world-class education for our children. Uh, and it's not just schools. This is also something that affects our public parks, uh, keeping roads in a state of good repair, funding public transportation, uh, all the things that we want to make our communities great places to live. Uh, we are hamstrung by an outdated property tax system that, uh, that, that denies us the resources that we need. Schools and Communities First creates a stable, permanent new revenue source. It's not a bond. It's not going to be something like uh, the California General Fund, which is so heavily dependent on high income proper, uh, personal income taxes that it, you know, the stock market is, market is crashing now. That's going to create a huge budget deficit for the state of California. Property taxes are a much more stable revenue source. Uh, and it's going to be a long term ongoing source that will rise in value as the California economy continues to grow. And I think it's really important to know that this is a winnable fight. People in California really respond to the message of closing corporate tax loopholes and raising money for public schools and local governments. It's something that fits with California values. It's something that I think Californians are ready to vote yes on. Uh, we've had polling that shows that, we, that this measure is currently in the lead uh, after messaging is, matches testing is run. So I think this is something where we can win and it will be a really huge win. And the last question is, what about housing? We're primarily a housing advocacy organization. What is the angle on housing here? First thing I'm gonna address, I know I've heard people raise a concern that this would worsen current incentives for cities to fiscalize land use. And those of you not familiar with that term, it's when cities uh, have a preference to approve commercial and retail development over residential development because it's better for their tax base. You might think, well, if this is raising property taxes on commercial property, but not residential property, it might worsen that incentive. There are a couple of reasons why I am not worried about that. Uh, and I can say I would not be working on this issue. California EMB would not be on the executive committee for this campaign if we thought it would worsen the housing crisis. One is that most cities do not plan all that far ahead. And 
what uh, new commercial development is already paying property tax at its full value because it's new. It has not had decades to benefit from a slow growing assessment. So when you improve new commercial development, it's already paying property tax at its full value. It takes a couple of decades for that gap to really build up. And most cities are not making budget decisions on a 10, 20, or 30 year window. They're looking at the next few years ahead. Most people in local office, they're not planning to be in office 20 years from now. Uh, so it's not something that is really driving their decisions. I would also say the primary reason that cities benefit from commercial development has nothing to do with property tax and everything to do with sales tax. So that incentive will be unchanged by this system. Uh, property tax revenue distribution in California is, I think it's fair to say a Byzantine process. Uh, this is partly because of Prop 13. There's not a direct relationship between the value of commercial property in a city and how much commercial and how much property tax revenue it gets. The money gets collected by the counties and then the counties disperse that money to uh, taxing districts. There can be thousands of those districts in a single county. It's based on the amount of property tax revenue that cities were collecting in the 1970s. It's a really bizarre kind of nonsensical system, uh, but this is what happens when we've twisted our whole property tax system into pretzels. This is undoing one of those pretzel twists, uh, but there's, there's really, it's a pretty indirect and attenuated relationship between commercial development and property tax revenue for a city. And then the most, the third important thing here is that the state has other tools to address this problem of cities zoning exclusively for commercial property. And there is in fact a bill in the California legislature this year that would allow, resi make residential an approved use on land that is currently zoned exclusively for commercial or retail. That's something that the state can just do uh, and would really undercut a lot of efforts by cities to fiscalize their land use. I think the other important thing here is that the incentives don't just apply to cities, they also apply to property owners. Right now, if you own property in California and it's vacant or it's an underutilized commercial property, you have much less incentive to redevelop than you would in other states because even as your property values skyrocket, your property taxes stay the same. And so it makes it much easier for landowners to land and to just leave parking lots, vacant lots, uh, underutilized strip malls and really high value areas. They can just leave them there because they're not on the hook for the property taxes going up as that property value goes up. Uh, this would realign those incentives. Landowners would have a stronger incentive to redevelop that underutilized land. Uh, we would hope with mixed, and, with mixed use uh, multifamily housing. And then, you know, I do want to return. $12 billion is a lot of money. Not all of that money can go to housing. A lot of it is spoken for for the school system, but you talk to California voters, they will consistently tell you housing and homelessness are their top priorities. I think it would be totally reasonable if we're gonna have a windfall of new money going into county and local governments, that they would dedicate some of that money to addressing the top priority of California voters. The other thing that I think is important here is that uh, one of the things that Prop 13 has done by gutting local uh, revenue bases is it has made cities turn to other sources. One of the other sources they've turned to is impact fees on new development. Uh, and so instead of funding, having an ongoing funding source through property taxes, they sort of front load the property taxes at the, during the development process. There is growing momentum in the state legislature to address this problem because Impact fees can be, I saw a development in Mountain View recently, it's paying $50,000 per dwelling unit just on park impact fees. So that doesn't include any of the other fees that the city of Mountain View might assess, $50,000 per new home just for parks. Um, there's a growing interest in the legislature in addressing this issue of excessively high impact fees, but there's a real concern about not wanting to blow a hole in local budgets. I think that's a reasonable concern. Uh, cities are using that money. So if we're going to limit this revenue source for them, they need to have another source of money. Uh, if we close this tax loophole and allow them to get more and bring in more revenue through property taxes, uh, it's easier for us to then go to cities and say, hey, you can't be putting all of these impact fees that are gonna discourage new housing. Um, so this is why I think schools and communities first is really great. 
I think it's something that is squarely within the values of UMB Action, uh, something that we should all support as a way to make our cities and our communities better places to live, more welcoming places that can accommodate the growth that we need. All right, let's see, is anybody in Q&A? Or is everybody just dropping things into chat? Uh, looks like we have a couple questions in Q&A. Are you able to see that? Uh, or let me just get started. So Alim, Alim asked, uh, how foreseeable is it that large corporations uh, will find loopholes to, find, to uh, this change, like create smaller cell corps under $3 million? Yeah, so we see currently loophole behavior uh, that companies engage in. There's a whole cottage industry that has arisen in California of ways to transfer control of property without transferring enough actual like legal ownership of that property to trigger reassessment under Prop 13. Uh, so that's only a loophole that in fact would be closed by schools and communities first, because this whole question of property transfer is going to be less relevant. You'll see reassessment happening anyway. Uh, I'm sure that companies will do really whatever they can to avoid having to pay this taxes, but we will be simplifying our property tax system here uh, and we will be creating an opportunity for the legislature that right now we have a limitation that is constitutional on our ability to assess these property taxes. If we move into the legislative space, it's much easier for the legislature to then crack down on those loopholes. And, you know, it's going to be a challenge. Like, is Disneyland going to be able to, how many shell corps is Disneyland going to create to own one unified amusement park? Is Chevron going to be able to effectively divide ownership of their refinery? I think it's more challenging uh, for corporations to slip under that loophole, uh, especially given that it's going to apply to all properties that they own. So you can't be like divvying up the property into multiple pieces. All right. What's that? What else is in the Q and A? Uh, okay. So Rowan asked. Um, huge chunks of the state general fund currently go to backfilling school funds. How would schools and communities first change that? Uh, would the new $12 billion in revenue go to schools or would it free up state general fund money or mix? It's a good question. And honestly, I don't know the answer to it. Uh, I know that uh, there is a set share of the new $12 billion that is dedicated to public schools. I think it's 40% to local schools. There's a tweaked version of the school funding formula from California that's being used for schools and communities first. Uh, because there was a concern from basic aid districts that using the existing formula would mean they might have their businesses paying more in taxes and not be getting any new revenue to their schools. Um, so this is going to ensure every school district will get some new revenue. The school districts that need uh, at most will get more new revenue. Uh, the rest of it is going, there's a portion going to community colleges, and there's a portion that's going to be going to local governments, county governments, and any special districts that are funded through property tax revenue. I would be surprised, honestly, if the state reduces the general fund spend. The idea of this is to increase the amount of money going to schools. Uh, but it's certainly possible if we find schools flush with cash that we would have greater flexibility with the general fund. Cool. Uh, okay, so George asks, is this what's referred to as split role? And maybe just expand on that. Why is it called split role? Yes, so this is called split roll, and the reason is because it splits the property tax roll. Uh, so you have separate rules for residential and commercial property. Uh, so you have reassessment for commercial property, and you maintain the existing uh, protections and limitations for residential property. Great. Um, okay, so Zach is asking, um, how close are we with the signature gathering? Uh, if we're short, um, how are we going to deal with that currently? Yeah, so really, really good news is that the signature gathering has been completed. Uh, last week, the campaign uh, asked everybody to turn in all remaining signatures that were out. They think they have gotten the number that they need uh, to qualify for the ballot after accounting for uh, duplicates and invalid signatures. We still need to have that verified by the state. Uh, and that process is, uh, you know, a little complicated right now. Offices are closed, uh, and it's not really the top priority for anyone in state, county, or county government right now. 
but we do think that they have gathered enough signatures to qualify for the November ballot. And I'm really glad we don't have to be doing any signature gathering right now because really it's not possible under current conditions. Yeah, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that as we get into the uh, other two ballot prompts we're gonna to discuss tonight. Um, uh, so are we concerned, but for that electoral, the November election, are we concerned uh, that people may not want to vote for a tax increase this fall, given the, uh, the current situation? Um, or do you think that maybe this is the kind of tax increase that they'll, they'll use? Like? I think it's a real concern. Uh, I'm also concerned just about how many things may be placed on the November ballot. Uh, I think this should be a top priority uh, for advocates because it is such a large ongoing funding source. I also think there's a real opportunity for this because California voters love taxing someone else where they really balk is when you ask them to tax themselves. Uh, so the great news about this is this is taxing big corporations. We are not asking the average Californians to pay anything for this. This is gonna be coming from large corporations who have done really well, who have had profits at record highs, um, and who have the resources to absorb this tax increase. Like Disney, you know, I'm sure they're taking a hit on Disneyland, but honestly, I'm not really worried that they're gonna go out of business due to this tax increase. Uh, so I do think we can make the case to California voters that this is the right thing to do in this time, uh, that it will not hurt their pockets, uh, and that it will in fact have huge benefits for their communities. So I think we can make this case there's obviously a concern, but uh, I think that's just reason for us to really redouble our efforts in making sure this passes because it's such a tremendous opportunity. Awesome. Um, so then on the assessment side, so does schools and community first require county assessors to assess the property market value? Uh, are you worried about maybe they would shy away from it? I know that probably county assessors haven't had to do any work for the last 40 years. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, so it does require assessors to do the work of assessing properties. It provides an implementation period and additional resources front-loaded to the assessor's office to allow them to do this. Um, you know, the reception to that among assessors across California has been mixed. Uh, I believe the Alameda County Assessor is supportive. The Santa Clara County Assessor has been waging uh, like a campaign against this. Um, I don't know, I, I think if you don't want to assess property values, the assessor's office may not be the right place for you. Um, sounds like a difficult job, I don't wanna do it. I'm not in the assessor's office for that reason. Uh, it is gonna make the assessor's office election significantly more important going forward. Uh, Cause what we don't wanna make sure we don't see is assessors, you know, sort of promising the big companies in their county, hey, uh, I'll go easy on you. Uh, and then, you know, then getting that, their support. So we are gonna have to pay closer attention to county assessor elections, but I think it's something that those, those offices can handle. Yeah, okay, and then I think expanding on that, um, Philip was asking, are taxes collected here uh, at the county level or at the state level? At the county level. Okay, um, cool. So then, uh, so Julia was asking, uh, where's the funding likely to go within, within school funding? Uh, pensions versus uh, infrastructure, salaries, uh, et cetera? That would be something that each school district would need to determine. Uh, there's not a prescribed way that this money is gonna be used. It's gonna be flexible. I believe there's an oversight committee that's gonna be put in place. Uh, but I think this is a chance to say, you know, politics never stops. If we get this passed in November, it's not gonna be the end of the political process. We're then gonna have to go to school districts and local governments and county governments and advocate for them to make the best use of that new money. Uh, I think we have uh, time for one last question. Um, let me just skip down a little bit. Uh, Julie was also asking um, between school districts, um, how is it, how's the funds distributed? Is the school district, sorry, school district that happens to have Disneyland in it uh, gonna make bank compared to other yeah, areas? Great question. So there is currently an existing funding formula that aggregates tax revenue across the state of California and distributes it to school districts. Uh, schools and Communities First uses a slightly modified version of that formula. Uh, the basic way it works is 
every single school district will get some new money on a per pupil basis. The school districts that are, have been identified through the existing process of the state as having the greatest need. Uh, so school districts in Richmond and Oakland uh, that have fewer resources generally available to them and more students who have greater educational needs. Those are, those are the main bases for, the, for that need determination. They will get more revenue. Every school district will get something. The district with the greatest need will get more. Great. Cool. Okay. I think that's all the time we have for uh, Q&A on Schools and Communities First. Uh, so I'll hand it back to Jordan. And then um, you know, we, we'll probably keep uh, discussing this uh, ballot prop and maybe we'll do some Slack AMAs or something else over the next few weeks as well. Yeah. And yeah. feel free to DM me in Slack uh, if you have questions about this. Feel, uh, I'll be hanging out on this call for a little longer. So feel free to message me in chat as well if there are questions you'd like me to get to. I'm always happy to talk about this, especially ways you know, to support. We're gonna, once things, once we're able to go outside again, we're gonna be doing a lot of campaigning for this and would love to have all of you join us in that. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Aaron. Um, and we can continue this conversation after the event if we want. Um, but next up, I'm gonna hand it over to Watch, who is the co-author of the San Francisco Community Housing Act, which is what we're gonna hear more about, uh, and chair of the SF Bernie Kratz Housing Committee. He's been working on this initiative for almost three years, and he's coordinated policy research and stakeholder meetings with PLOR Magazine, SEIU 1021, Sunrise Bay Area, and DSA San Francisco. So go ahead, Laksh. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, can you all hear me fine? It's my first time doing the Zoom Q&A, so I hope it's, it's going to work out. Um, let me just share my screen. Are you able to see the presentation? OK. Yeah. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Laksh. I'm one of the co-authors of the Community Housing Act, which uh, is a Green New Deal for public housing, uh, municipal housing for San Francisco that we've been working on, as Jordan mentioned. Um, the idea behind this is essentially to try to create a system uh, like what's being done for Medicare for all for healthcare, but uh, with public housing. Um, initially, you know, starting off as a, as a small program that'll grow hopefully more and more year over year. Um, so let me uh, go into some of the details of this and you can feel free to leave questions in the Q&A section and I'll uh, take a look afterwards. So the overall view of the Community Housing Act is it's trying to create a public housing program that can't be defunded. One of the major issues of HUD public housing was the quite frankly racist and classist way in which uh, HUD funding for public housing was repeatedly cut and replaced with alternatives like Section 8 um, and the public housing program was essentially allowed to be dismantled and the tenants themselves had very little power over what happened in the unfolding of that. Um, the program is aiming towards having a large scale de decommodification process of putting land back in the public trust. And the funding source is a gross receipts tax. It's similar to the November 2018 Prop C for homelessness uh, that'll go towards acquiring, building or rehabbing housing at a rate of about 1,500 units that are either acquired or constructed every three years. Uh, part of what makes this a Green New Deal is that we require clean power SF, uh, electrification, so replacement of natural gas lines, uh, decarbonization of building materials, and um, a new standard that the city just set for municipal construction is lead silver uh, or green point rated. So that helps make sure that the housing is helping to also combat climate change uh, another part of the measure is our community councils. I'll go into a little bit more detail on that. And there's a requirement for amenities and frequent transit near the housing as well. And obviously the frequent transit contributes to this being part of a Green New Deal. Uh, just giving a summary of who can actually qualify for the measure. It is public housing for all. Uh, anyone who technically lives or works in San Francisco or qualifies for a preference Really, the only one is certificate of preference, which is from the redevelopment era, will qualify. If you're accepted, you do have to sell any property you own or vacate any other place you rent in San Francisco. This is not supposed to be a second home. And there's a lottery to fill building units that are vacant based on an income distribution of five income brackets. Uh, so new tenants would be equally spread out among those brackets. Um, I can show what those brackets look like um, in this table here. Uh, you can see about 20% of units go into each uh, of these area median income brackets. So 0 to 30% of area median income is usually considered the extremely low income bracket. 
Um, and there's some examples here of the kinds of uh, tenants that might be involved. Um, if you're actually making less than 26,000, you're actually making less than minimum wage full time. So uh, there are certainly cases where this happens, folks who are retired, folks who are on SSI, folks who are experiencing wage theft and so on. So that was a very important income bracket that we wanted to make sure we serve. Uh, in low income areas, and I'll, I'll show a map of this on the next slide, there is, uh, we basically allow an income distribution, a building level income distribution that focuses more on the low income brackets. So the definition of low income census tract, and this is something we set as an initial definition. It certainly, I know there are a lot of definitions that for example, the MP, uh, MPC uses. Um, the definition is the median income is less than or equal to 80% of San Francisco's all households median income using the American Community uh, Survey five-year estimate. In those areas, we basically say uh, more than 20% of units have to be for those, uh, lad those uh, lower two income brackets. Uh, now the exact amount that'll be for those income brackets really depends on community input, which is incorporated in the measuring community input here. It means not you know, uh, rich homeowners, it means low income residents, the actual community councils, uh, tenant advocacy organizations as well. And it has to be contingent on financial self-sustainability of the program, which is an important part of the measure as well. Uh, because the only way that really this program can expand is if rents are able to cover the basic operating costs, capital uh, renovation costs, and uh, any potential loans or debt service that need to be taken out. So uh, here's a, the map of what a low income census tract is. This changes every year, um, and this is based on the latest available data. Um, you can see that um, the main areas folks wanted to make sure were covered when we were developing this were areas in Bayview Hunters Point, uh, certainly uh, parts of Tenderloin and Chinatown, um, other parts um, here near the Portola. Um, Mission and 16th is still considered uh, a low income census tract in the current definition. Rent in the program is capped at 25% of gross income. This is a change from the usual 30% of income standard. And in fact, in the history of public housing, 25% uh, was considered the affordable standard in around, I think, the 50s or so. Um, and when, you know, the housing was more full of folks of different income ranges, uh, it was able to self-sustain on that level. Uh, there is a minimum rent that can be set for buildings. Uh, we talked a lot with homeless advocates and other folks, uh, former public housing tenants, current public housing tenants around this. Uh, it can't exceed $93 a month. That basically comes from the minimum wage. Uh, and it's, so it's indexed in a way to inflation. Your income is generally assessed every two years and uh, for folks making below 50% of the median income, so low income tenants in general, uh, it includes utilities, which also used to be the case uh, for public housing. But in, in our case, we expand that to say internet has to be included as part of the utilities and that should be the case in, in the modern day. Another important part of this, and I think this is very important considering coronavirus is that when your income unexpectedly declines, your your, your rent can also go down, uh, basically using your past 30 days income. And these two factors together, the rent and the income distribution are how we're able to guarantee some amount of self-sustainability. I don't have the calculations available in this slideshow, but basically operating and renovation costs for this housing very conservatively, including union labor would be somewhere around $13 a square foot. Um, and the rents are in, in most cases are more than enough to cover that plus some amount for uh, covering loans as well. Another part of this measure is that it does rezone land as it's acquired. So the city can really acquire or construct any building for that 500 unit a year goal. Um, per unit costs are a lot higher for small buildings. And so city has to meet its goal. And when we met with Kate Hartley before she stepped down, she made it clear that it's very likely that the city is gonna focus on larger than 15 unit buildings. Uh, really, you know, five to 15 unit is where the cost curve starts to bend and 15 plus is where the per unit acquisition and rehab costs are mo most cost effective. Um, after that acquisition or construction happens, the land is rezoned as P, that means public use. This actually hasn't been used very much for actual residences until the teacher housing proposition, Prop E. Um, Prop E set its own restrictions on, on you know, ground floor height, rear yard, but as it is, they have no restrictions at all in the planning code on density. Um, at least that I was able to find. So, so that's another pro uh, that this measure allows after the housing is acquired, it can be rezoned. There is another aspect to this though. Um, 
you know, some of the zoning restrictions have to do with things like open space and so on. Uh, we do allow community planning. It's not, it's not like a zoning requirement, but community planning about things like green spaces, shared social spaces, the kinds of apartments that are allowed. Um, so that's thinking more about number of bedrooms and square footage uh, and so on. One other part of this measure is that we have these tenant associations. These are not at all like a homeowner association. Their main duty is really to protect the tenants. Uh, some of the ideas behind this came from the public housing tenants associations that have existed in San Francisco. Um, but one thing that they have the ability to do is actually withhold rent collectively. Uh, state law allows you to withhold rent individually, but this is a collective action. So it, it, this is in response to potential uh, potentially the city not taking adequate care of the housing and that was a very important uh, protection that tenant advocates wanted to make sure we had. Uh, they can compel meetings with their supervisor to make sure their political voice is heard and generally you know of course they're going to advocate for improvements in times of peace they would also these community councils would also uh, be putting on community events and so on. There is a compensation for the members who go to these meetings $150 um, you know, this was an answer to the question, how do you make sure that folks who are sometimes managing several jobs can actually go to community council meetings, keep them ongoing? When we, when we responded with a stipend, most folks thought that was a, a good start for this. Uh, one or two last things I wanted to note. So I did mention that we have a requirement for public transit within 0.4 miles, frequent public transit. Uh, this actually ends up covering most of the city with some exceptions. Uh, that has to be at least every 10 minutes for a route during peak commutes. I'm actually from uh, London where 10 minutes is infrequent. You actually want to go for five, but I know Muni is way behind where other cities are in other parts of the world. Uh, there's dedicated funding for those transit frequency improvements. It mostly goes towards hiring more Muni operators and the transit frequency has to be in place within a year of the housing complex opening. Uh, we also have a requirement for childcare facilities that are well invested to be nearby. I uh, spoke with the Child Care Planning and Advisory Council about this to make sure the language was uh, suitable to them. Um, and community meeting spaces as well. Pretty common in social housing abroad to have uh, these kinds of spaces. And they can be used for all kinds of things, even a community kitchen um, in some cases. The funding, as I mentioned, is a gross receipts tax. It's averaging about 0.6% on business revenue over 25 million. So that raises $410 million a year annually. Now, of course, these projections were before the potential recession that might be coming. And so the number will go down. Uh, the tax rates are set by different categories. And these are the existing gross receipts tax categories that San Francisco has. Um, we do exempt retail and wholesale completely because those are actually prone to the biggest job losses and the biggest effects of taxation. And even with a very small tax on them, um, they're pretty low profit margin. Uh, the higher um, tax industries here are uh, basically information is 953.2 tech industry and uh, 953.6, which is finance and, and other professional services. And this is the, the breakdown of, of expenditures. Now, I, I won't go through all of this, but just want to call out that there is money for workforce training, which is an important component, right? If this program is going to expand, it's going to probably grow faster than the city's ability to hire for this. And so training new jobs is going to be important. Um, at the end, uh, we have about $660,000 per unit as a city subsidy now. If you compare that to small sites, the typical acquisition rehab subsidy there is 400 to 500,000 a unit. Uh, construction costs overall are somewhere north of $800,000 a unit now. So this is a lot more suited towards acquisition until it's easier to lower construction costs in other ways. Uh, and I, I wanted to conclude just with implementation timelines. So um, I won't go into all the details about this, but uh, essentially, we're creating a, an entirely new municipal housing infrastructure and hiring for that will probably take a good portion of time as well as planning. And so there's about a two year implementation period before the goal actually kicks in. Uh, we came at this by talking with some department heads about how long it would take not only for the end to end process of listing a job and, and, and securing a person for that job, but also union negotiations around creating uh, new positions because 
uh, essentially all of San Francisco's public housing has been privatized and the housing authority has been, is mostly doing section eight at this point. And so um, this would be creating an entirely new infrastructure within city government, as opposed to the housing authority, which is always sort of its own entity. That's uh, it for now. Um, if folks have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. I know I just spoke a lot, but uh, yeah, thank you. Great, thanks. Um, so I'll go ahead and read the questions. I think that, that makes things run a little, run a little smoother. Um, so the first one I see, I actually see two versions of this question. One is, uh, can you talk a little bit more about the community input process? Uh, and first, how will you avoid neighborhood orgs or homeowners from blocking new affordable housing in their neighborhood? Uh, yeah, the community input, um, so the question is how it would it become broad, broadly representative? Um, a lot of this was focused on low income tenants and we do write like things like community input around affordable housing. It's with the input of low income residents, community councils who are, you know, typically going to be representing low income residents, tenant advocacy organizations. So um, that's sort of how we try to empower tenants and not uh, NIMBYs. Uh, the question also says, what are community councils exactly? They're, they're tenant associations. They're basically groups that can uh, organize and advocate for their own interests. You might know the Veritas Tenants Association has been trying to stop the sale of, of Veritas buildings uh, to another private uh, owner. And so um, as it is right now, tenant associations are pretty uh, loosely organized, but this would kind of give a formal process and also some amount of power to the tenant associations. Does that answer the question? Yeah, and then there was another one on there that I accidentally dismissed. Um, on the uh, site acquisition side, how will you avoid neighborhood orgs or homeowners from blocking new affordable housing in their neighborhood? Um, that's a good question. I think it would have to rely quite a bit on other streamlining legislation. We haven't, you know, a lot of this bill didn't include um, everything that's necessary. Um, I, I think, you know, the fact that they wouldn't be able to argue the zoning because if we're rezoning it as P public use, there's nothing that can be argued really about limiting density and so on. Um, and I, I think it is going to take some amount of community organizing as well on top of that. Okay. Um, is the $13 per square foot maintenance cost per month? That's a, that's a per year. Okay. Um, what was the thinking behind focusing on business taxes and not residential or commercial property taxes? Yeah, um, so uh, we are limited because of Prop 13 in terms of raising ad valorem, so based on the value property taxes. Last time we had tried to do a parcel tax, uh, uh, and uh, the most progressive way we could think of doing a parcel tax was on square footage. Um, and when you do a parcel tax, though, there's no way to exclude commercial properties, or sorry, exclude residential properties. It has to be on all uh, properties. Um, so that was one wrinkle. The other thing is we tried to put in exemptions based on income in that parcel tax and there's very limited authority on being able to do that from state law. So I would say uh, for the most part state law is limiting a lot of these and that's where schools and communities first is going to be very helpful in <clears throat> at least reforming Prop 13. Um, yeah so the, the the short answer is we would need to do with some kind of a square footage parcel tax and anytime we even mention parcel tax, people don't even really pay attention to the details about this is square footage and this is exempting low income homeowners. It's, 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 it's a difficult sell we found, but that was in our last 2018 campaign is when we tried that. Okay. Um, question on zoning. Could you elaborate on how the zoning process is going to work? Is this going to have to be on the east side because it's dense zoning or could it be anywhere? No, um, because uh, the city can basically um, acquire any property or, or construct on any property and then it'll automatically be rezoned once it becomes part of the program. It'll be rezoned as P, public use. And so the existing zoning restrictions wouldn't apply. Okay. Um, is it wise to significantly raise taxes during a recession, both for economic reasons and because the source of funding will be unpredictable? Yeah, I, that, that is definitely an issue with the business tax. I think, you know, it definitely... Going back to what Aaron mentioned, uh, people might be more likely to pa pass a tax on large businesses. Um, the hit on revenue is definitely going to be real this year. Um, 
and 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 the business tax is an uh, a, a fluctuating source. One thing that we did change relative to the homelessness proxy is that it's on revenue over 25 million instead of over 50 million. We met with the chief economist Ted Egan, and he said that's probably a better way of making it more stable uh, source of revenue. But even uh, I mean, right now there's probably going to be quite a drop, regardless. Um, the plus side, though, is um, these business taxes are collected quarterly, and so if uh, if if there's a recession that hits, there's still the tax revenue from before, so that the city can act pretty quickly and dramatically to help uh, save folks where they are. But yeah, I mean, tying things to the economic cycle is is definitely uh, a concern. Okay, uh, what's the balance between building new housing versus acquiring existing buildings? Yeah, there's nothing spelled out in the legislation about that, except for uh, that in the first six years, we do say prioritize acquisition because uh, it tends to be more uh, cost effective, uh, much quicker, and it'll probably help hit those goals a lot sooner. Um, it, there, it's some of it, a lot of it is also left to the strategic plans that the city is going to develop. So determining what's an optimal mix of acquisition and construction um, which will depend on a lot of things like uh, land value and, and labor costs and so on as well. Okay. Um, I think we can do questions for about five more minutes. Um, what delta do the proposed gross receipts tax rates represent from current rates? Yeah, so um, I, I, I don't remember off the top of my head the, the initial gross receipts tax rates. I know that the homelessness proxy was about averaging about a half a percent. This averages somewhere between 0.6 to 0.7 percent. So it's adding a similar amount to the November 2018 proxy, if, if, um, if that helps. Um, so those are the rates. We do have a broader revenue base because we're taxing over 25 million. So the overall revenue ends up being uh, higher than that proxy. Okay. Um, do the small sites acquisition costs numbers you mentioned also include rehab or, uh, or construction? Uh, small sites costs include acquisition and rehab. Uh, small sites is, is only acquisition and rehab, if I remember correctly. Um, and that's the city subsidy uh, portion. Okay. Um, next question. SF uh, successfully privatized its public housing program. Uh, why go back to having the city do it via the public sector? I'm very glad that this question was asked because it wasn't the city government that did it. It was the San Francisco Housing Authority. The San Francisco Housing Authority was a, is a federally funded and state chartered entity. So the federal defunding of that entity absolutely had an impact. The second thing is that it's important to understand it's not a part, it was never a part of city government. Um, the city and county of San Francisco has actually now taken over the housing authority because it was in receivership. But I want folks to imagine that this, this agency was just sort of operating on its own. And really the only person ha that had oversight over the San Francisco Housing Authority was the mayor through the Housing Authority Commission. But because of a lot of racism, because of a lot of classism, a lot of mayors didn't even really properly care for the Housing Authority until it got to the point where it needed to be privatized in order to open up capital to basically allow for rehabilitation to happen through the rental assistance demonstration program that was uh, pushed by Congress. That doesn't mean that the future of housing has to be private housing only. That points to the need to, I think, create a self-sustaining public housing infrastructure, something that can be structurally self-sustaining in a way that public housing wasn't designed to be, and that can be regulated at a local level and funded at a local level in a way that it can't be defunded by a Republican administration uh, as was done very often with public housing. All right, um, I'm gonna jump down a couple because I see a couple questions on this topic. Um, what city agency is going to choose the sites? Uh, how are they gonna be insulated from political pressure? And can the zoning change be blocked by the planning commission? Uh, it would be the mayor's office of housing is the main one that's, uh, that's executing the program uh, and um, I guess, I mean, they are separate from the Board of Supervisors. They're under the mayor's office. Um, the Board of Supervisors does have an oversight committee that they can appoint, but um, that would be the main input Board of Supervisors can have. The Board of Supervisors can also change the legislation itself, uh, amend it as long as it doesn't conflict with the uh, purposes of the program. So they can't cut the unit goal, for example, but they, and they can't make it unsustainable, but they can make other tweaks over time just to keep the program going. 
Okay, and what influence does PlanCom have on this, on the rezoning? Uh, I, I don't think that they would be able to block any changes to the rezoning because that's in the planning codes. Uh, and yeah, they'd have to amend the planning code somehow through the board, I guess. But um, I, they wouldn't be able to undo the the zoning change because that's that's a key purpose of the measure is making the land public. Yeah. Okay. Um, question on why are we going for gross receipts tax while our city, our home is still in court? Or do are you assuming we need a two thirds uh, vote? Yeah, um, so I, we spoke with the, um, we asked the city attorney's office and the Department of Elections and they still say that this is gonna need, on the voter guide, they're gonna say that this needs 50% to pass. Now, if it gets between 50% and two thirds, it is gonna be uh, stuck in court. Um, that we think, you know, puts us in a stronger position to actually advocate for these funds in much the same way that Baby Propsy and uh, Our City, Our Home are in right now. So it's not an ideal situation. I'd like to see that court case resolved, but we've been following along on that and um, it's going to take a while. Okay, let, let's do uh, one more. Um, is there any consideration of adding units like ADUs to the newly acquired buildings? We don't have anything in there right now. Um, I guess it could be added, but um, I, I think most of the use cases I've heard of ADUs are usually in, in least uh, in, in private home, homes and so on. But um, the question was about adding ADUs. Um, well, we, we, we do allow any units that count under this program have to be either dwelling units or SRO units. Um, we don't have anything specifically for ADUs. I think it could be amended, but we'd have to be thoughtful about how that might undercut the unit goal in some way, yeah. Okay, um, and I see another one that actually can't be answered on Slack, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask this also. Um, this is the second one. It seems like a cool concept, but it's gonna take some time. Uh, what other policies do the Berniecrats support uh, to address the housing crisis? Yeah, I mean, we're very on board with a lot of the policies in the Homes Guarantee. Um, I, we haven't formally endorsed it, but I, I know our housing committee has been very uh, excited about the, the federal Homes Guarantee that's being pushed. Um, absolutely, I'd like to see this be done at the federal level because they have the greatest power of the budget and the greatest ability to even deficit spend, which a city can't do. Um, but, you know, I, the biggest issue we think is the, the need for more funds. Yeah. All right. Um, cool. Thank you, Laksh. Thank you. And with our remaining about half hour, um, I'm going to hand it over to Sam Moss, who's going to talk about affordable homes now. Um, in his words, he's the executive director of the Michigan Housing Development Corporation, a founding member, board member of UMB Action, and slightly unofficially, the greatest affordable housing developer of all time. You're welcome for that. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. All right, uh, let me just share this real quick. Make sure everybody can see. <clears throat> can everybody see that? Yeah? Okay, cool. Well, thank you for having me on. Um, so, uh, the Affordable Homes Now Charter Amendment um, is uh, kind of in its third uh, version. Uh, we've been trying for a couple years, and this is the most recent version that you know, essentially makes uh, it by right to build 100% affordable housing throughout San Francisco, um, as well as certain amounts of mixed income housing. So in the last decade, uh, San Francisco, um, you know, we, we've, San Francisco and the Bay Area has only created about one unit of housing for every eight jobs. Um, there are a ton of employees in San Francisco. Um, and I think that a question that everyone asks it's themselves is, you know, where are they going to live? Um, the housing shortage is clearly not good. I don't think all of us would be on a webinar at uh, 730 on St. Patty's Day if it was roses, but you know, it's people, the environment, the economy, a housing shortage affects everyone. And I mean, I feel like now more than ever, we're, we're feeling that. Um, people across the country are spending way too much on, on housing. Um, and for the sense that for the sake of the ballot measure and most legal definitions, um, we believe that, you know, cost burden spending too much on housing is when you are spending more than 30% of your income on housing. Um, housing has also been, you know, kind of the gateway for the middle class, the gateway to wealth building in our country, definitely in the Bay Area. And when you prevent people from being housing safe, 
you know, it's, it's not always about when can you buy that first home. It is also about when can you focus on everything else in life and not, you know, worry about being check to check for your rent. Um, and so in that regard, we, you know, we do believe that this is an opportunity uh, to break down that barrier. Um, this is a very easy to follow um, self-explanatory map of the San Francisco planning approvals process. Um, it is unnecessarily complicated. Um, you know, what this measure would do is quite literally uncomplicate and speed up the production of 100% affordable housing and mixed income projects. And, you know, as you can see or not really see, this process is, it's just, it's just a nightmare. And so, you know, one thing about this ballot measure that we're, that we're, that we're hoping for is that it will un, uncomplicate all this. Um, one of the other issues that is, is a problem when you're building, especially affordable housing, but also market rate housing, is that no one really knows who's making the decisions uh, at the Planning Commission or the Building Inspection Commission. Maybe it's the supervisor and maybe it's the mayor and maybe it's your community leader. Um, and one of the things that this ballot measure wants to focus on is getting rid of that ambiguity. Um, there needs to be a clear path. It needs to be written down and legally binding. People need to be able to follow it on both sides of the decision making process. Um, I don't know the answer to this. If anyone online here does know the answer to what the Planning Commission does, please DM Theo because he will tell me later. Um, but again, you know, just like I said in the last slide, uh, it is really hard to know who's making the decision when it comes to building housing. Um, and as it is right now, even with 100% affordable, any decision that's made is still subject to some other appeal down the road. And we aim to stop that. Um, the cost factor, um, both emotional and monetary, is, is a big thing. It's very time consuming. Um, it costs a lot of money to be able to move your project to the front of the line, um, both from a public standpoint and a private standpoint. Um, so the costs being inflated, that gets passed down to renters, that gets passed down to potential home buyers. And again, this uh, ballot measure aims to stop that. Um, you know, I think that having buy right housing again, as far as the rules being written down and just being able to follow them, it's, it's extremely important as a person who builds affordable housing, uh, all jokes aside, one of the hardest things that we deal with is planning for the un planned, I guess you could say. We, we, we are constantly building in months, if not years of extra time and cost to ourselves before we even start a project because the rules keep changing and there is favoritism. And the sooner we can clean that up, the sooner we can start housing everybody. Um, so what is the solution? Um, the Affordable Homes Now Charter Amendment uh, believes it can unlock about 40,000 units through streamlining approvals. That number is based on uh, available lots and properties in San Francisco, especially when it comes to affordable housing. We look for about 10,000 square feet or more. Um, and it is certainly a subjective number, but it is an attainable one um, and something that clearly would be helpful in this situation. Um, and we believe it would unlock these units mainly because a lot of them just aren't financially feasible in our current building environment. Um, so how does the measure work? Um, if passed, um, two things. So if a project falls within the existing zoning regulations, so because of the Prop E that just passed and other recent zoning changes, this charter amendment, it only aims to amend the, the entitlement and permitting process. It, does, it is not a changing of zoning in San Francisco. If a development and it does fall within the existing zoning rec regulations and it is either 100% affordable or it's a market rate project that has mixed use of, it adds 15% more than the legal requirement, um, which is currently 20.5% uh, for 25 units or more. Um, if it adds 15% on top of that, then you get buy right uh, development, which means that you just submit for your permits, as long as it's all according to the law, then you get approved. There, there is no commission hearing, there is no discretionary review, there is no appeal process. Um, so, you know, you're looking at years of projects, you know, not, not being on hold anymore, projects getting sped up by six months, one, two, three years even. Um, and uh, as far as the 100% affordable projects, um, they have to have an average of 120% of the area median income. 
um, and that's about $147,800 right now in the Bay Area for a family of four. Um, and But I do also want to point out that any project that's 100% affordable that uses tax credits or bonds or pretty much any other state or federal level funding uh, will not have more than a 60% of AMI average. So this is just a little bit of a breakdown of you know, what someone making 25% of the area median income compared to 130% of the area median income, what it looks like. We throw out these acronyms all the time and a lot of us forget that uh, not everyone memorizes them as a hobby. So um, I'm happy to you know, forward this on to anybody if you'd like to review it. Um, so this is, you know, a breakdown of what we believe for the 100% affordable projects, the savings and the time speed up that would happen. Um, it requires prevailing wage, but I can also say that the affordable housing industry in San Francisco uh, almost always has 100% union projects, but, you know, hopefully this will open up new projects of developers who maybe hadn't thought about San Francisco. Um, and so to that end, it will require at least prevailing wage. Um, and so just as a real world case study, uh, so mission housing, uh, so is uh, pertinent to the last develop, uh, presentation. Valencia Gardens was a public housing development that was in such disarray that in 2006, through what would eventually be the rental administration, the RAD conversion, it was called Hope SF and Hope 6, uh, Mission Housing bought the old public housing, which was 255 units. It was a square concrete block um, and knocked it down and rebuilt it as 15 different buildings with 260 units. Now, that is great. Um, that's 260 families. You know, that's, 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 that's hundreds and hundreds of bedrooms. But we were also told that because of the zoning and because of discretionary review and because we you know, we, there was the ability of the neighbors nearby, the Guerrero Street Neighborhood Association and others to block it, that we needed to build the building to look like the residential area. And so we built it 20 feet lower than the height limit. Um, and, you know, we've recently gone back and asked an architect if this ballot measure had existed, you know, what, what would you have built? And, you know, it's closer to about 750 or 800 units. And, if you go through bedrooms wise, that's like twice the amount of people who are on the homeless shelter wait list every night just at this building. And we, we've done that throughout San Francisco with all of our big projects. And, you know, I think a real world example of why we need this project, this, this charter amendment is that we're, we've just, we've lost thousands and thousands of units when we had opportunities to build them. And we just, we can't make that same mistake with the, there are a lot of vacant lots still in San Francisco and we can't make that mistake again. Um, here's some polling on the ballot measure so far. Um, it polls very well, um, as you can see. Um, you know, I, I honestly, I think it takes a monster not to want 100% affordable housing to be buy right, but I'm clearly biased. So um, just some more measure vote progression for everyone. Try to go slow. Um, and as you can see, you know, it dips, it dips down a little bit, but it's, I mean, it's still, even after opposition messaging, it's still polling very, very well. Um, and so I, if, if that was be a reason for someone to be on the fence, I think you can rest assured. So uh, as with everything, uh, this campaign timeline is uh, subjective and subject to change, but um, you know, I just figured we'd throw it up there so everybody could see it still. Um, we don't have any updates regarding signature submissions, so gathering and things like that. I think all campaigns are pretty much in hold mode, but, um, you know, rest assured if you email, um, and if you email anyone at Gimby Action or the campaign, like we'll, we'll get you the information. There'll be inform and information who to email at the end of this. A couple things we're asking people to do. Um, you can record a one minute video on why you support affordable homes now. Um, now more than ever, it's sharing digitally will be great. Um, and then of course, we're always very appreciative to have op-eds on why you support the measure. So to get any information or to sign up for the mailing list or to volunteer or anything, here is the information. And I assume that this will be listed in the notes afterwards. And that is it. So I'm back now. How'd I do?
Cool. Great. Um, I see one question on the list. If anyone else has right. questions, feel free to add them. Um, but I think the question on a lot of people's minds is, uh, do we think that signature gathering is feasible? Do you think we're likely to get enough in time? Yeah, I mean, I, everybody should feel free to answer. I, I think that it's feasible in the sense that I think it's important. I don't know, mission, you know, mission housing, my nonprofit, we have all these contracts with the government, federal, state, local, um, we have all these deadlines that we have to hit every week, every month. And, you know, those deadlines are getting pushed out just like the government's things are getting pushed out. And so, you know, I don't know. I, there's a lot of talk about whether signature gathering is feasible or not. And I, I hope that our elected officials can come to a, a reasonable solution that isn't penalizing the, you know, the signature gatherers. I, I hope there's an equitable way that they can figure it out. I'm in favor of every single measure that's been submitted so far being put on the ballot, but uh, that's not for everybody. Cool. Um, I don't see another, any other questions in the list. Right. If, if people have them, feel free to add them. Um, for signature gathering, uh, what does the process for uh, collecting signatures and getting people trained to collect them look like? So I know that we're having train. We will. We were scheduled to have trainings at the YMB Action Clubhouse, um, and I believe at other places with the virus and things being up in the air. I would, I would say that there's probably a day or two until we have that all hammered down. But the email information, the Affordable Homes Now campaign, that is a really great place to send these kinds of questions. Um, I'm sure that the YMB Action Slack will have a bunch of updates on this. So you know, if you're not a member of the YMB Action Slack, I I think you should become a member um, and, you know, that's just my humble suggestion. Um, but yeah, I think that just like with a lot of things, I really believe, I mean, I mean, I'm cautiously optimistic that, you know, hopefully maybe even by the end of the week, things are a little more clear in terms of, I don't know, pushed out deadlines and things like that. Okay. Um, and there's one more question that popped up. Uh, how can we publicize the videos so they can have the best impact? So, I mean, I, think that I, I mean, I think the campaign, you know, sending them the campaign, I know there's the hashtag and, and things like that. Um, I would make them and literally just, you know, tag the ballot measure, uh, tag the campaign or send it to the campaign and let them use it. But really just, you know, I, I think letting your friends know about it, getting it shared as much as possible. Um, and just by word of mouth, hopefully they'll be out there. Cool. All right. Thanks, Sam. All right. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Theo to close up. But one thing I want to I want to say before I do that is uh, first, thanks everyone for coming. And I'm going to drop a form in the chat room um, just to collect everyone's feedback on how the event went. Um, this is the first in what we hope is going to be a monthly series of these sorts of educational deep dives. Um, and I would love to hear any feedback that anyone has on things that we can improve on, both for like the specific format, the video chat and stuff or the video call and stuff um, as well as um, ideas for future topics or anything that we could do to make this a better experience for everyone um, and so with that Theo you can go ahead um, yeah and thanks again to our panelists um, uh, and thanks again for everybody for um, for showing up and attending and asking some great questions I uh, just want to encourage everybody to stay online stay on slack keep talking to people um, I posted a whole bunch of calls to actions in the SF general channel. Uh, one thing that was brought up um, that we're working on that I forgot to mention at the beginning uh, was we're trying to get some emergency funding for transportation for Muni and Caltrain and BART. Um, so there's an action network petitions for that. Um, and then uh, stay tuned for more ideas on how we can organize online and, and also stay, you know, uh, in touch with everybody online and, and please feel free to suggest more things and, all that. So um, thank you again for coming and um, stay tuned for more, for more actions. Cool. Thanks, everyone.